Oh, well, hey there. This is your favorite history teacher of ninth grade. Unless, of course, you have more than one history class, that is. This is section three, a bloody conflict. And move, World War I is moving right along, but uh, now the America is involved, so things are changing quickly for the Allies. Um, but we see here that things had not been going very well for the Allies. We haven't talked too much detail about this in class, but they were really having some trouble. And Germany had the hint that they might be able to win this war before America got involved. So we really needed to speed it up. Uh, thanks mostly to the German U-boats, they were doing some damage. So America's going to join in. Uh, and we're going to head over to Europe. So it's time to have our friend here, as our analogy, Mr. T. A pitiful! Oh, Mr. T. No, no, help us. Yeah, that's right. So American troops coming over didn't really know what they were doing at first. The first troops sent over, the first few thousand, weren't really well trained, but we need to get some fresh bodies over there. Our doughboys, remember we said in class they're called doughboys, American soldiers. And they definitely helped boost the morale, if nothing else, of the <laughs> British and French soldiers that were pretty exhausted, I'm sure, of living in muddy trenches for the last three years. So I'm sure they were happy to see us, even if they couldn't understand English, if you're French, that is. So this guy... Admiral William Sims, since his title is Admiral, that means he must be in the branch known as the Navy, I hope you're saying. I can't hear you. Hmm, speak louder. Just kidding. So his first big success, or America's first big success really, is the use of the convoy system. The convoy system. So be asking yourself, what the heck is a convoy system? Well, the problem was the German U-boats had been sinking the British ships at really high rates, really, really quickly, and, and the British really were starving. Uh, the people there they were blockading pretty effectively so we need to help them out so what could we do so you think about what would you do if you needed to stop having u-boats sink ships and my answer the answer that admiral sims had think flying v if you ever seen the great great movie actually there's three of them called the mighty ducks you know what i'm talking about but what happened was the convoy system was instead of having ships sailing alone one at a time, whether they're transporting goods, well, I guess it would be goods is all we really care about. I was going to say or people, but uh, goods is what we, was what the Germans cared about stopping. That we could combine these merchant ships with troop transports, like, uh, with an es escort of navy ships, like ba uh, battleships or uh, better yet destroyers. Destroyers were a lot faster and smaller. So by having like this flying V sailing across the ocean, moving all the supplies. Um, when a U-boat pops up and fires a torpedo, well, all right, there's the U-boat. Even even if he does hit a ship, the, all the other American ships there are going to make sure that they fire and, and sink that U-boat. So guess what? It actually worked really, really quickly, and it was a great idea. As simple as it was, it was a great idea. And pretty much after this point, the U-boats are useless, besides little things here and there. So now we have our American boys and our cargo safely heading over to Europe in late 1917. And I hope you remember who this guy was, the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, the American troops. Or what's his name? Are you asking yourself? Say it louder. No, try again. Ah, oh, yes, that's right. General John J. Pershing. And he wanted the Americans to fight in separate combat units at first, not just be combined with British and French. Um, I think mostly just to make sure that the, the French or British weren't throwing our American boys into battles that we were kind of doomed. Make sure that we had some control over our boys' fate. But actually, he does decide to give in and, and have our boys refresh some divisions of British and French that were weakened. So um, he was pretty, known as a, pretty well known as a great leader for our American troops. Yeah, bad news for the Allies, though. Right as we're entering, right before we entered, actually, the Russia drops out of the war. What's going on in Russia is they're having a big old civil war. The people there are starving. Okay, the, the war was not good to them. Remember, they're fighting over here on the Eastern Front with the Germans, and uh, the war was not good to them. The people are starving in a lot of cases. The people don't have f fuel to heat their homes. And the Russian winter, you know, that's not th – if you think r winters are bad here, you should see the Russian winter – um, so the people rose up and they forced the Tsar, sometimes Tsar is spelled with a T, T-S-A-R, but this is the more traditional Tsar. Nicholas II stepped down from his throne, which most Russians were happy about. Um, and there was this middle-time middle government that 
no one was sure what was going to happen. Who, who's going to take charge? Well, it turns out, for the first time in history, communists are going to be in control of a national government. The Bolsheviks is their political party name, just like we call our party the Democrats or the Republicans or the Green Party. Um, the Bolsheviks was the name of their party, but they were communists. So there you go. And their leader was Vladimir Lenin. Good old Russian name, Vladimir. So I don't know if you've heard of Vladimir Lenin. I assume you've heard of communism. We'll talk a lot about it a lot this year, but there it is. It's a very historical moment, 1917. Oh, that's, there's Russia. So once the Bolsheviks, the communists, are in power in Russia, they say, you know what? Are people eating is more important than winning a war. Are people having fuel is more important than winning this war. So he pulls out of the war, and they sign an agreement with Germany, and they call it the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, um, named after some cities. And 1918, that's it. It's official. Russia's out, which is great for Germany um, because Russia gave them a bunch of land, their western western side of Russia, the part that's closer to Germany, they gave them a, a ton. I think they actually lost a third of Russian land. They gave up 30%. So, wow, that's a big, big loss. But the good news is they don't have to fight. So, uh, that's that's what they care most about. That's what the people care most about. So, Germany's pretty pumped, I'm sure, because now they only have to fight on the western front in France here, where the trenches are. Not over here, not on the eastern front. They just have to fight on the one side. So they move all of their troops across the country. And this really, really made it hard for the British and French. And America wasn't quite there yet. We we weren't, uh, I think from what I read, that we weren't, our, our men, definitely not the vast majority of them at least, were not there ready to fight. So this was going to be a tough few months for the, the British and French until we get there. Oh, wait a minute. What's this? Oh, I shouldn't have put this. I'm sorry. This is a mistake. Oh, how embarrassing. This is my to-do list. Well, you can see at least, at least I'm doing pretty well. I'm making use of my time at home. Huh? Got almost everything on the list. Uh, anyway, back to the PowerPoint. I'm sorry about that. So Germany, they they know by this point things aren't going so well for them, and they know that they need to do as much as they can before America gets involved. Because hey, if they can force the British to sign a, an agreement to stop the war, then that's it. Game over. So they try this big attack on the Western Front. Here's Germany. Here's little baby Luxembourg. There's Belgium. Of course, Paris. And they try to push through these forests here. And they get within 40 miles of, of Paris, which is like what happened at the very beginning of the war, too. But by this point, the Americans are there, and we help drive them back. And they call this the Battle of the Argonne Forest, which is right here. The largest attack in U.S. history. And I think that still stands. I could be wrong. Hey, feel free to look it up for extra credit. Extra credit point if you look up Argonne Forest. Is that still the largest attack in U.S. history? But it's the September to November. And if you know anything about the war, World War I ends in November of 1918. So that shows you that this is getting pretty close to the end. But look at this. 600,000 Americans involved in this battle. Wow. That's way bigger than the city of Pittsburgh. The proper city, which does not include us. We're not in the city of Pittsburgh. We don't go to city schools, therefore, we're not in the city. But that's a lot of people to be involved. Um, Americans destroy the German lines. At that point, it's pretty much good night, Germany. Um, but the Battle of the Argonne Forest actually is in the video clip. Uh, depending what class you are, you may have seen this clip yesterday, or you may be seeing it real soon from this movie, The Lost Battalion. It's a couple years old now, but it's a great, great World War One movie. So... Uh, if I haven't shown yet, make sure you convince me to show it to you soon. At least part of it in class. Um, if you wanted to, you could search on YouTube for the Lost Battalion and to find the last scene, because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to show you that in class. We don't, we just don't have time, unfortunately. But you can definitely YouTube it. Last time I checked, they were there. But this guy made quite a name for himself, Alvin York. He's American, and remember this word, conscientious objector. He actually started out when he was drafted as a conscientious objector. Um, he he was morally opposed to war. He didn't want to go and fight. But he talked to his pastor, and his pastor said, you know what, I think maybe you should do this. <laughs> Believe it or not, his pastor convinced him. So he went, and um, he made quite a name for himself. Pretty much single-handedly became the most famous American soldier in history. I mean, besides like a big general, like Eisenhower or Patton or someone like that from World War II. But what he did was... 
he was armed with his rifle and a revolver, and he killed, the numbers are a little off depending where, where you check, but about 25 Germans single-handedly in one event, and then with six other Americans, he took 132 Germans prisoner. And hopefully I'll do this reading with you in class that talks about it, where he used these turkey calls. He was a big hick from, uh, I can't remember what small town it was out west, but he did a lot of, a lot of hunting which is great, and he hunted turkey, and he used, used the turkey call, which the Germans were not familiar with, and so he did the turkey call, and they looked around confused, and he started picking them off one by one <laughs> as they ran down the hill. So, yeah, he became pretty famous. There were movies made about him, and uh, I'm sure every soldier would love to have that, that fame. So the war is going to finally end. Uh, fighting is going on with Austria-Hungary and the, and the Turks. They're useless. They're out of it. It's pretty much just Germany by this point. You know, Germany had been the biggest power all along, but it, the other countries are gone. Forget it. So German, the German people forces its emperor to step down. And there you go. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, the fighting stopped. So think about that. Can you figure out what that means on the 11th hour, 11th day, 11th month? That means on November, month, 11th month, November 11th, 11 a.m., 1918, the fighting stopped. They signed an armistice, which remember we said is a ceasefire that it ends the war. Now the peace, the actual peace treaty, did not get signed yet. It's not going to get signed until next year. But they did agree to stop fighting, ceasefire, and there you go. The war is done. So don't forget to take the quiz on Blackboard, and I will see you tomorrow.